Hey guys, thank you so much for watching. Real quick, before I get into this video, I want to tell you about PopCultureZone.com. They are a website specializing in comic books, some of the hottest variants, and CGC comics. And for those raw comics, if you are shipping to the domestic United States, you only pay $4.99 flat rate shipping. PopCultureZone.com. Now on to the video. You really want to know who Superman is? <laughs> Watch this. Oh! What is going on, guys? It's Brown Simple Man's Comics back with another great episode of that Simple Man's Comics and Friend podcast. Super, super fun guest with me tonight, Mark Guggenheim. How are you doing? I'm good, man. I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm super excited for this. I, mm -hmm. I just got to take a time. And if you guys might have heard the name Mark Guggenheim before, if you haven't heard the name, I'm sure you are aware of some of the work that he's done. And I, I have, there's so much here that normally I kind of just say it from, from, from my mind, but I want to make sure I cover it all. So, so excuse me for possibly reading here, but Mark Guggenheim, his credits go back to co-creator of ABC's Eli Stone with Greg Berlanti, executive producer of ABC's No Ordinary Family Show, working with Greg Berlanti, he and Greg Berlanti and Andrew Kreisberg adapted Green Arrow into Arrow, which we now know as the CW Arrowverse, which also working with Berlanti, Kreisberg, and bringing in Phil Klemmer, created The Legends of Tomorrow. But that's not all. He has co-wrote several episodes of Netflix's Tales of Arcadia with Guillermo del Toro. I'm sure you guys know that name as well. And he actually won an Emmy for Best Writing of Animated Series for that wrote the screenplay for Percy Jackson's Sea of Monsters, and he is currently, this is one of my favorites right here, he is currently writing the Green Lantern series with showrunner Seth Graham Smith for that awesome HBO Max show coming up. And he has also written comic books, characters such as Aquaman, Wolverine, Punisher, Blade, Flash, Amazing Spider-Man, Justice Society of America, and the list goes on and on, so no doubt, I am sure somewhere between movies, television, Netflix, comic books, and what I didn't even touch on video games, you guys have touched Mark Guggenheim's work. So super, super awesome guest. And I am excited to get into this tonight. Thank you for your time, Mark. Oh, no, thank you. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. I hope the Zoom is not covering my blushing. Uh, <laughs> I was hope I kept telling him before we started, I was like, you got to do the George Washington crossing the baton. Uh, and, but <laughs> that was a great, talked, great introduction. <laughs> yeah, we talked about some great work, but we, we what we want to talk about tonight is some upcoming work. We talked about comic book writing, and we there's a lot of history still that I didn't even cover within that short segment. So make sure you guys go back and look. He's gone. He's been all over the place, guys. And he is getting ready to have a creator owned comic from Dark Horse come out, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm actually, so it's kind of funny. My 2020 New Year's resolution before I knew there would be a, you know, global pandemic uh, was I, I was like, in 2020, I'm going to do more creator owned books. Um, and because I hadn't, my last one was uh, Stringers that, uh, at Oni Press that came out in 2016. So it's, it's been a long time. Um, so I, you know, I just started like writing these various, uh, you know, scripts. Um, and I had gotten uh, with my friend Kyle Higgins. Uh, he was like, you know, I've, I've been sort of acting as an editor uh, and a rabbi for, for various people. And he offered to do that for me with, with this project. And this is an idea that I've just sort of had burning a hole in my notebook for like over 10 years. Uh, I, I, ever since I saw the, the movie Wally, -E, actually, the, the comic book is inspired, believe it or not, by Wally. -E. Um, because it, basically, it's like I, I you know, I saw Wally, -E, loved Wally, -E, and I thought about like, you know, the whole process of evacuating the earth. And, and I thought when, you know, when that, you know, when that ship leaves, everyone on earth has got to be on that ship or they're, they're screwed. And I thought, what if someone went missing like 24 hours before the ship takes off? And then what if that someone's a daughter? And what if her dad is, you know, trying to find her, you know, before literally the last flight. Out? And that's what, uh, that's what the series is called. Last flight out. Yeah, um, last flight out. And I, I kind of, the viewers probably saw me kind of giggle and squirm because when you mentioned Wally, now, full full 
disclosure, Mark was nice enough to give me advanced copies of the first three issues, which are absolutely fantastic. And the whole time I'm like, man, this is like Wally, but turned up by like 10 million and it's <laughs> like super crazy because anyone that watches my channel knows I'm a, a big Disney fan and I'm sitting there going, man, yeah, this is kind of like Wally. And there's so much that goes on. It's, and it's such a great story just within that first three issues. And to be honest, you know, that's the PDF and yeah, there's, there's the cover page, but it just read like, I was like, wow, I just went through three issues because I just kept oh. going. What <laughs> happens next? What happens next? So is it uh, a limited series, mini series broken up by arc? What, what can the viewers expect from Last Flight Out from Dark Horse Comics? You know, it's funny. It's funny you should ask because so the story was conceived of as uh, a six issue mini. Um, but as I've been writing it, I kind of have come up with an idea for a way to continue the story. Um, and if I do, the second arc would, would actually be very different. Uh, I can't really say what it is without spoiling the end of the, of the series, but um, I, I've been thinking a lot about it. Uh, you know, that's kind of like, you know, this is something we used to do on Arrow all the time, which is, you know, we'd, we'd reach the end of a season and we'd immediately start thinking about the next season. And I kind of find myself doing the same thing with Last Flight Out. So uh, even though Last Flight Out is a, that's a very definitively ending title, um, I've got, uh, I've, I've got a, an idea sort of percolating on, on a way to continue it. Yeah, you know, thinking of like movies, I'm thinking of like, um, the cheesy action movies, right? And next, the next way you can call like last flight out, hold the boat or something. Right, yeah. Or like, you know, last flight out, really the last flight this time. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, like it's, it's kind of like a, you know, an, an 80s rock band, like this is the final, final tour. Um, you know, so I, yeah, I gotta like, I think what I would probably do is I'd probably figure out a way to just work flight into the title and change the words on the other side of that. Or like Die Hard, last flight out, fly harder. <laughs> oh, that's perfect, fly harder or fly hard. Yeah. Now, written by you, also fantastic interior art, and it's uh, art in there is by, um, excuse me, because I mispronounce names all the time, but Eduardo Ferragato? Yes, very good, yes. And who's, who's killing it? Who's like just crushing it? Actually, and Kyle put me together with Eduardo. Uh, and Eduardo's actually been helping him out with some of the art on Radiant Black. Um, and Eduardo's fantastic. He's got this incredible sense of storytelling and his, you know, his lines are clean. His images are very evocative. And, you know, I, I always, you know, I always say to every artist I work with, like the script really is just my, what's in my head as the way I think the story should be told but I always encourage the artists to tell the story in the way that they feel most comfortable. And Eduardo is really great about that. Like he'll, he'll tweak things from my scripts or, or he'll give me notes and, and have me change stuff up. That's like super smart. Like it's like, it's very, it's, it's, it's very annoying to get a note from Eduardo. Cause it's like, why didn't I think of that? I should have thought of that. I've been doing this a while. Um, but he's, you know, he's just got a, an incredible storytelling sense. And there's a lot of scope and vistas and double page spreads in this book because uh, we're dealing with essentially the end of the world. Yeah, and it's crazy because, you know, you mentioned the Wally, the disaster story that's going on. But I also, like I said, I'm, I'm an 80s, well, 90s big movie guy as well. So it makes me more of a fan. But within that disaster story, I kind of felt a little bit of Armageddon. And when I say that, you know, I get a little bit of that Bruce Willis, Liv Tyler story because, hey, we got Armageddon, we got disaster coming on. But then within that story, there's a father, daughter, a strange situation going on that's carrying out and it ties well into the story as well, right? Totally. In fact, I, you know, it's funny. I hadn't had Armageddon in my head when I was writing. I, I, I've got two daughters and I'm, you know, like Ben, the protagonist, uh, I'm a workaholic. So um, that, that I, I think that was what I was sort of working out. But, you know, now that you mention it in the back of my mind, I probably did have Armageddon uh, as one of my influences because uh, it's, it's, you know, it's definitely that kind of tortured, you know, uh, difficult, you know, father-daughter relationship. Um, and 
to me, like that's kind of where the series lives. Um, it's, you know, we say like it's, it's a father and daughter trying to reconcile at the end of the world. Um, and it's, you know, their relationship is just very, it's juicy and it's complicated and, you know, he's got some points and she's got some points and they're both right and they're both wrong. And that's, that's the fun character stuff I like to write. Yeah. And stretching, stretching a little bit within that story with the Armageddon storyline, no way, but there's a little bit of Ben Affleck character in there too, that kind of ties in as well within last yeah. night out because there's a there's a boyfriend as well that kind of gets in the mix i don't want to i don't want to get too deep into it i don't want to give it away by any means uh-huh. but you got a little bit of a triangle going and that, that plays out in, in like some of the later issues two and three which is fantastic but i like the fact that you you take multiple situations here and then you think about it as oh global disaster and we got to evacuate earth but then it's like wait there's so much more than that it kind of digs deeper into it where hey there's this father yeah he's been absent you know he pretty much the daughter's whole life and it kind of plays on that you got flashbacks but all of it also is one of those classic storylines where he's been absent but everything he's kind of done it's been hey for my daughter and for for other people it's just when everything that he's missed while doing it though kind of plays out within it as well i think that's something like you know just about every father of of daughters or sons can relate to um and and quite frankly every mother like you know it, it, when you're a parent and and especially if you're a working parent um it, you're always juggling that tension between you know, I, I want to provide for my family, but at the same time, I, you know, I, I need to be there for my family. And how do you square that circle? There's not enough, there's never enough time in the day. Um, and uh, I, I think I was, I was working through, working through a lot of stuff, uh, you know, writing this. Yeah. And it's crazy because you always get that with the cliche, right? Build a life, not a living, but hmm. it, it's easier to read on paper than it is to, to, to put into real life because you got to kind of provide for the family. And then there's always opportunity costs that come up where, Hey, I got to do this, but what am I missing out on here? And, and it's funny because my father, when I visit him now, and we talk about back in my childhood, he'll say the same thing where he's like, Hey, you know, I wish I could have been around more for this, but I also think some of that is like, hey, you know, your father's guilt, don't even worry about it because I had one of the best childhoods. You know, I lived in Germany as a kid. I lived, grew up wow. in Northern Virginia. I was, I said, all the stuff that I got to see and got to do. And I, I, a lot of my comic fandom and everything that goes into my collectability is based on my childhood. And if yeah. it was bad, I, I don't think I'd That's be doing as much. Yes, that's exactly right. Exactly. I'm, I'm the same, same for me, man. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a child of the seventies and eighties. And I basically like, I always say like, I go back to comic book conventions and I'm essentially just buying back my childhood, but just at vastly inflated prices. Yeah. And, and it's great. I mean, I enjoy it. So as a father, I find myself doing the same thing as well. So I think it's just, you always want to, Hey, keep in the back of your mind, provide for your family. Um, getting yeah. back into it. So we got the disaster going on and basically there was, there's three flights. We're down to like the last set of flights. Like if you miss this one, yeah. Good You're luck screwed. to you because <laughs> the earth is dying. Yes. And, that, and that, that's the thing. It's like, it, it, it is, a, it has a little bit of a climate change story to it. Um, not in a polemic kind of way, but basically that's what's, that's what's happening. The life, the, you know, the life expectancy of the planet has been reached. And, you know, it, it, so, you know, Ben is trying to find his daughter in a place where there are earthquakes and fires and, you know, and here's like just a little twist that not everyone on earth wants to leave. So there are people who are staying behind um, and that they're not the kind of people you really want to run afoul of. And spoiler alert, Ben runs afoul of them. Um, So there's, there's an action adventure component to it. um, In addition to the, you know, the character storyline. And, and 
Uh, it's been fun sort of juggling those two things. And like, you'll see like the cover of the second issue is Ben literally hanging on by his fingertips, you know, uh, trying to avoid falling from a collapsing building. Um, you know, again, Eduardo has just killed the spreads here. There, there's just so much scope. Um, you'll see in the third issue uh, that uh, Wrigley Field, the baseball stadium in Chicago, has been taken over by essentially a warlord. Um, and it's like, I just thought it would be fun to have, you know, if, if I was, you know, a criminal, master criminal uh, warlord at the, at the end of the world, and, and the city was basically evacuated. What would I want to take over to make my my evil headquarters? And I'm like, I'd pick Wrigley, Wrigley Field. That'd be fun. Yeah, and it's a great also because within that series, you you kind of talk about the characters. But what I like that you've added also is those mm -hmm. like one sheets where it's like, you know, added storytelling where it's an email or it's an ad or it's a it's a resume or yeah. you talk about the warlord and it talks about, you know, kind of like the 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 profile on this yeah. person and kind of how they came to be, but um, definitely. Yeah, actually, the, oh, sorry to interrupt. Um, yeah, the, the text pieces, that's what we call them. And we, there's probably a better name for them um, have been some of the, the most fun uh, things to write and construct. I like, I like uh, the resume that appears in issue three. I, I designed that. Like I actually, you know, laid that out myself and um, sent, you know, the script off to Diego Sanchez, who is our letterer and our designer. And he's like, you know, this is kind of cool. I can, I can just publish this. And I'm like, great, go for it. Like, and, and that's, you know, Diego is the, you know, he's the unsung hero of the whole book because he's the one coming up with these Twitter pages and these, you know, documents, government documents. And uh, I've asked him to do something in issue five. That's like a, you know, it's a double page spread map of the United States um, that, you know, is, it's, it's heavy lifting. Um, so he's, he's been killing it. Uh, it's, it's really helped, I think, take the book and, you know, raise it up a couple of levels. Yeah. And like, I, I enjoyed it and full, to be fully honest, a lot of comic books like that, I kind of like, Oh, that's just added. That's just added and kind of spoof over it and, and keep going. Yeah. So I want to get into the story, but with this one, it's like, Oh, wait a minute. You know, it, it ties more into the story. And when I say skip over it, Jonathan, Jonathan Hickman does a lot of that within the X-Men stories. And yeah. I was like, oh, there's too much here. I can't read what's <sighs> going on. But, you, know, you know, it's funny that the thing I've, I've kind of discovered is there's an art form to doing those text pieces. And I, I do think like Jonathan probably pioneered that not just in in uh x-men but he was doing it you know for years uh in his various creator owned books and i really like it um but there's definitely an art form to it where first of all you, you want to give the reader the opportunity to skip it over if they want to i mean you know they bought a comic book they want to read a comic book i get it um but if they do read it you want it to be you know easy and entertaining and digestible. And, you know, I think, you know, I think Jonathan is the, you know, he, he's the master, he invented this. And, uh, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I think it's very, very cool when any writer or artist can basically contribute to the medium and, and help change, you know, the way the medium actually plays out. Uh, and I think it's, I think it's incredibly cool. So I, I, I thank Jonathan for uh, his understanding and in, in ripping him off. <laughs> I guess. Well, also, I like yours because, you know, like there's like, I don't want to say tweets, but there's instant messaging when one of them and it's like pictures, almost pictures of real people. And I'm like, I wonder who these people really are. And, you know, and then I was like, well, I'm looking at it. And then I start reading it and I was like, oh, that brings out more information. And then there's the resume. And then there's the ad for another, um, another company who I've, I kind of want to get into some more of the, the characters and everything without giving the story away. So we sure. talked about the main protagonist. Ben Kaywood, who's the architect, and I like how you spelled it like A R K. Oh, yeah. I love a good pun. Yeah, and then um, who is basically those those last flights out and everything that's called what Project Tevat oh, Noah. Tevat Noah. Um, so uh, in the Old Testament, the ark that Noah builds builds uh, in Genesis is called Tevat Noah. So um, I thought, oh, that 
you know, that, that seems like a good name for, for these ships. Um, so it's Tevat Noah 1, Tevat Noah 2, and Tevat Noah 3, and that's, that's the one that uh, is the last flight out. And then there's one other group of people that we haven't really talked about much yet. And to help get his daughter, you know, the Secretary General is like, I can't risk losing you, but if you got to go, you need to take the Tevat Noah Logistics and Appropriation Squad who was almost like a SAR and rescue team, but they had some more other purposes. I don't want to get into that right here because that, that, that kind of gives away some more of the story that I think is great for, we're not giving you the whole thing here. We want you to read, read the issues because they're that good. But this team helps, goes and gets his daughter from Chicago. And like I was telling you right before we started recording, movies guy, of course, it remind me of the squad from, aliens that's going with ripley that the camaraderie the banter the i love the military lingo the back and forth i'm i'm a marine corps veteran myself so i kind of picked up on some of some of that and some of the banter that we had but can you kind of explain who that logistics and appropriation squad is with yeah um uh, without let's see without spoiling it um it basically th this was actually an idea of kyle's um you know, Kyle sort of suggested that if you're going to, you know, undertake this global effort to build these three ships and evacuate the world, there's going to be there's going to be some jobs that need doing that aren't so bright and shiny. Um, and that's that's really the group that uh, Ben finds himself with. Uh, and he doesn't ask for them. He, he you know, like you said, the secretary general kind of voiced them on Ben, uh, given Ben's importance to the world and the project. Um, and it gets tough. Um, it, it, the relationship between the leader of the logistics team, Burke, and Ben is, is very, very cont contentious. And um, things really take a turn uh, at the, the end of issue four um, between the two of them. Uh, and Burke, just FYI, uh, is actually not named after Paul Reiser's character from Aliens. He, he's named after David J. Burke, who is the showrunner of a show that I love called Wise Guy that um, all, all like pretty much everything I work on has some sort of wise guy reference and Last Flight Out is no exception. There, there are a few, um, uh, like for example, there's an FBI dossier that appears in issue three that is written by uh, Agent Frank McPike, who was Jonathan Banks's character uh, in Wise Guy. And there's, there's a, you know, it, all my stuff is sort of dusted with all these references. And, uh, uh, I love Easter eggs. I, I wouldn't pick up on the Wise Guy Easter eggs, but the stuff I can pick up on it, I definitely enjoy. It. And the fans of Wise Guys that do pick up on those as well, those are the things that always kind of like that added bonus into stuff that's like, that's kind of cool. Thanks. Yeah, I, I, you know, I'm, I always approach everything I work on as a fan first. And as a fan, I like those Easter eggs that, that, you know, always tickled me when I was watching movies or reading comics or, or you know, or, or watching TV shows when I was growing up. It's, it's just fun. It makes it feel, you know, lived in and uh, you, and you feel like you're in on an interesting joke. So I, I really dig it. Now, speaking of Easter eggs, I got to ask, there's not a different Strokes Easter eggs with one of the names, last name being Drummond, is there? No, no. Okay. <laughs> Where I came up with that name, um, I honestly forget. It wasn't, it wasn't different Strokes, though. <laughs> no, I watched the show and I enjoyed it. But Yeah, sometimes, so sometimes the names come from something and other times I'm literally just pulling it out of my ass. That's an ass name. <laughs> But, but yeah, so like we said, different stories play out in here and, and that logistics and appropriation squad adds a different layer to the story. And like you mentioned before, you know, there's people on there that you don't want to run into. And what's great about it is once you start getting into each, each of those three issues, um, the, the plans kind of fall apart as we, as we see, which always makes for a great story and always reminds me of, you know, Mike Tyson, right? Everyone's got yeah. a plan until they get punched in the face. Well, they kind of get punched, uppercutted, almost TKO'd, and that's kind of where the, the, the third issue ends, and I'm already like, WTF, <laughs> <laughs> tell me, I feel like I'm in Greece now, tell me more, tell me more. Oh, but, that's awesome, thanks, man. I Well, wait till you see the, the cliffhanger, the cliffhangers at the end of issue four and issue five are like, real like, 
oh my God, what the hell are they going to do now type of cliffhangers. Last Flight Out issue one, do we have a release date for that? Yes, we do. September 1. So very soon. Scary yes. soon. Yes, and we'll, we'll definitely be having... You're, I'm sure to be talking about it again on the last call of the show for when I'm talking about FOC and also on release day. But September, that's hitting previews like yeah. right now, right? Yeah, it's. Uh, I think. I think actually, the Dark Horse has already solicited the first issue, um, and uh, we've gotten already a really great response. And uh, you know, comic book folk have been reading it and really digging it. Um, so it's been great. Actually, it's it's really really nice uh, to to see that. Oh, there there seems to be some real interest in this book. It's kind of cool. Now. People within comic books, you know, you can't let this go without saying it because it seems like everyone talks about it, right whenever there's a comic book. A lot of people talk about, hey, is it, I see this as a movie. I see this as a TV show. And no doubt, I kind of honestly, when you read it, you kind of you can't help but think about it that way. Now, I know Dark Horse Comics, this is coming up from Dark Horse Comics. Back in like May of 2019, they announced a net look, Netflix first look deal. We've had some other Dark Horse Properties, Umbrella Academy. Yeah. Could we possibly maybe see this coming at Netflix? Or do you, can, is there anything you can share or you don't know? Or uh, you know, I'll tell you this, you know, I, it's totally a possibility. Um, you know, uh, the, you know, my, here's my attitude. My, my philosophy is, is that the, the story has to work as a comic book first, first and foremost, because I, I think the fans and the retailers are hip to the idea of taking a screenplay and just turning it into a comic book. So like, you know, do I think Last Flight Out would make an awesome movie? Yeah, I, I actually, I do. Uh, do I think it would make an awesome Netflix movie? Yes, I do. Um, but my job at the moment is make an awesome comic. And you'll see even like the way it's written, you know, with the text pieces, with flashbacks that begin every, every issue, it's structured like a comic. I've written it like a comic. I've done things in it that you can only do in a comic. Um, so, you know, if it were to become a movie, what, what, what writer or artist, you know, wouldn't love that? Um, I, I certainly, you know, would be, would be foolish to say, I don't want that. Um, but it's got to work as a, as a great comic book first. You know, I, I'm thinking, you know, when, I, when I'm writing, I'm only really thinking about two things. I'm thinking about the floppies and I'm thinking about the trade. Um, and I'm thinking about like, how do I make sure that it works as a individual issue and how will it work when it's all collected in one volume uh, and make sure that it's a satisfying read because people are paying money for this stuff. So yeah, you and, want them to, and to not get only the trade, trade, but then the deluxe hardcover edition uh -huh. that we hope we get, you know, the, the slip case. Um, and, and I look forward to, to all of that. I'm one of those guys that, especially for stories that I really love, I pick it up in floppy. But I also like, hey, that's my collector copy. So then I pick it up in trade. And then if it's yeah. a larger series, you know, a, a longer running series, and then it's like, well, now I got to get the omnibus. Me too. <laughs> Me, I mean, I, I've got a collection of Dark Knight Returns. Like I've got just about every different edition of Dark Knight Returns you can possibly think of. Uh, and I love all of them for different reasons. So yeah, definitely make sure you guys comment down below. Let me know what you think so far. Are, is this an, a story that you're going to be interested in picking up? I will tell you that I'm not just saying this for the love of saying it, but those first three issues, if you like those Armageddon disaster and then also the, the family drama, the, it's, it's a fun, uh, fun's not the right word, action-packed drama and I want to say seat of your pants roller coaster because that's very cliche, but it honestly is. I'll take it. And it's a great story. So I know myself and a lot of other comic fans out there, Dark Horse is kind of, you know, some great series, a lot of licensed series, but I'm a huge fan on this channel of creator owned independent comics. And I also think where artists such as yourself, creators such as yourself, when you get into creator owned, I love that because then it kind of sees like the story behind your mind. You're not in, in that swim lane of, Hey, I have to stay within the licensed property. This character I'm writing, he can't do that. You don't have those limitations here. It's creator owned free. 
let me let me write the story that's going on in my mind and it all plays out on the page and the interior art is freaking fantastic there was a couple pages where i was like man this doesn't even almost look like a, a comic book just because um i'm not sure who the colorist is also if it's the same person but it, it's, oh, the art got, is crazy we we have a a, a a one colorist for issue one and another uh, another colorist for issues uh two through six and you know it, it you would never know because the you know uh the natalia the the artist for the colorist for issues two through six you know did such a great job with marcello you know duplicating marcello's colors from issue one like it, it reads seamlessly you know um to the point where you know if we collect it you know when we collect it as a trade i, I may even kind of pull a, a robert kirkman on it and pull out the covers and put them at the end so you can just read it all the way through um Though now that I think about it, I'm not sure that uh, that would work with the flashbacks. Yeah. I got to think on that. Yeah. See, I, gotta, I see, I got got I got work to do. And then we're gonna get that fandom up within it. So then we're gonna have a letter section in, in, in later issues. I love I love letters pages, man. I I. I, I, you know, I grew up, you know, with them, you know, very old school and I, I love them. They're, they're always, you know, some of my favorites, uh, you know, favorite parts of any comic. Yeah. So definitely make sure you guys let your LCS know, or if you're ordering them online, make sure last flight out, add it to your pull box, add it to your, your pre-order list. We're hitting, it's in that previews window right now. Previews, you can always get two months before release. Final order cutoff. I'm sure I'll talk about it again at that point. And this will be your last chance to get that pre-order. And like I always say time and time again on this channel, from previews to pre-order at FOC, a lot of times that's where you can maximize that discount and guarantee yourself a copy. Cause I wouldn't be surprised, you know, Dark Horse Comics, they don't do like super big print runs. And this might be one, I don't want to say it's going to be sneaking under radar, but I think it could be. And then once the story gets out and people start talking about it, you're going to be chasing it. and don't do that. Get your pre-orders in now. And that's why I'm glad to have Mark on this channel to talk about this. I absolutely loved those three issues. I know I've said that before and I'm kind of beating the dead horse, but it is truly a remarkable series from the start. I can't wait to see how it's going to end up. And I also kind of wanted to talk to you. One more thing also is yeah. we talked about the beginning of the show is arrows, all the CW verse, all the television, all the movie, the screenplay, the video games, this is crazy. So I wanted to ask you, with your experience in television, movies, video games, and comics, what are your thoughts on the two mediums, like separately? And then do you like the fact that we're seeing them together now where a lot of comic book adaptations? And second part is, which one do you prefer to work mostly in? Or do you have kind of like, hey, I like this about this part, but I like this part about comics more than I like TV and media. I'll take the second question first, um, which is, I, you know, I, I, I'm very, very lucky. I mean, I'm super lucky that I get to work in all these different mediums because the, because the truth is they, they all have different pros and cons. Um, I, I will say I love telling stories in comic book form. There, there's something very, very, very satisfying when you're like, you're, you're working out the page and, and, and you're working out how the story comes you know, with a particular page turn and that sets up double page spread and you're, you're, you know, you're trying to sort of like, you know, tell you're, you're pacing out the story in a, a very sort of specific way. And I just like the, the, there's a certain, there's art to it, obviously, but there's also a certain math to it that I kind of really dig. Um, at the same time, you know, it's been a year and a half, you know, since I've been on a TV set and I really miss being in production on something. Um, you know, there's something about the energy of a set and, and working with actors and working with the crew that I really, really miss. So the, the truth is there's, there's pros and cons to both. Um, I really like, to me, TV, film, you know, comic books are really, they're kind of like my kids. Um, they're, they're different, they're very different from each other, but I love them all equally. <laughs> Um, and then I, now, of course, because I took the second part first, I forgot the first part. Um, what, what was the first part? I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm so the, the first part is since you've worked in both, right? Do you know, 
how do you feel? Do you feel like being separate? Do you like them? The, do you like oh. the fact that we're seeing kind of a, a merge of, of those properties where you're seeing a lot more comics coming to, you know, the silver screen? Uh, kind of what are your thoughts on a lot of comic book being yeah. being adapted right now? I, I as a fan, uh -huh. and I know a lot of other comic book fans is like, hey, love it because you're seeing the stuff play out from the page. And I think it brings new comic book readers. But, you know, I'm always interested in you as a creator. If it's like, do you have a, an opinion either way on, you know, what you kind of yeah. think about that? I, I, you know, I always approach everything as a fan first. That's, that's what got me into this. And it's really what keeps me in it. And as a fan, how could you not love it? I mean, it's incredible. We're living in this, you know, I, I want to say like five years ago, we were in the golden age of, of comic book movies and TV shows. Now we're in the multi-platinum age, you know, or whatever you want to call it, because it's incredible and it just gets better and better. And, and I'll be honest, like the one thing working in Hollywood that I think is a real problem is the fact that all TV and film now has to be based on some pre-existing IP. And I really, really dig the fact that comic books remains an area where new IP can be generated, new ideas, new characters can be created and, and dramatized. Um, that's really, I, I'm a sucker for new ideas um, as, as a fan and as a writer. So the fact that comics exist uh, a, a, in a way that can provide those, you know, basis for television and film is, it's fantastic. It's, it's just only good news as far as I'm concerned. That, I mean, that's an excellent point you brought up because even, you know, no inside knowledge like you do behind the, the business, right? Just as a movie fan, and I hear a lot of people also complaining sometimes that you you see trends for a while. And one of the trends that we saw recently was like, hey, we're rebooting all these 80s franchises with right. new friends. And it's like, man, even my dad was like, you know, it'd be nice to see an, or, or an original movie instead of a reboot every now and then. And just you bringing up that comics can kind of provide that genesis of that new IP that can be adapted. That's a point that is outstanding. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because it's that perfect opportunity for comic books right there. Yeah, it's the, it's the whole reason why uh, at the beginning of 2020, my New Year's resolution before I knew the world was going to come to an end uh, was I, I want to do more creator owned books because, look, I love I love playing in the DC universe. I love writing comics for Marvel. I love you know, I, I love adapting, you know, the stuff into different mediums, but I was really craving. I had like this, you know, sort of like hunger to, I also, I want to, you know, not just play with the toys in the toy box, but I want to invent a couple of new toys to play with myself. And, uh, you know, like you said, create your own books. That's, that's a great area where you can actually do that. One, one more question. And I don't mean this in, in any type of negative way when I say this, but uh, the, the, the quick question Twitter. is... You, you have to wake up pretty early to be negative. You know, the, the, to... The, the quick, easy question is, why Dark Horse? You know, oh, great you question. Know, what, what, um, yeah. All these other indie creators out there, was, was there something yeah. specific for Dark Horse you know, that kind of brought you on board for that? I, I'm just curious. And like I said, it's not... Yeah. Negative by Dark Horse. And, no, it's a great, it's a terrific question. I'll, I'll be honest with you. So um, I I was doing a general, you know, in Tyler, we call them general meetings, you know, where there's no specific agenda with Keith Goldberg, who I, I know going back, you know, forever years and Mike Richardson of Dark Horse. And Mike was just asking me what I was working on. Um, and I mentioned, you know, uh, Last Flight Out because it just happened to be what I was working on. Uh, at the time of the Zoom and Mike immediately like, I, I want that. And I'm like, well, I'm not pitching it. I'm like, I'm not like, you know, uh, I, I'm not asking. And he's like, no, no, he's like, I, he was just so passionate about it. And, and Keith also like so passionate about the idea. I'm like, you know what? I wanna be, you know, I want this book to be at a place where the, the people, you know, publishing it are, are feeling as, as uh, you know, passionate about it as I am. Uh, and I was, I was just blown away, you know, passion will, will win me over any day of the week and twice on Sunday. And, uh, you know, Mike and Keith were just, you know, so gung ho about it, it was, it was like, okay, this is, you know, the, the, it, I wasn't trying to put it at dark horse, but uh, it, it seems like that's the right place. 
Yeah, and that's a great answer, and it makes a lot of sense because I'm kind of the same way. It's it's passion and, and where the love is. You know, if you feel kind of like the, you'll go through a lot more for people that you feel kind of that yeah. passion and love being reciprocated back to you. So, hundred percent, per- perfect answer for that. And um, th- kind of coming to a close here, I just want to also give you the opportunity. Last flight out. Anything else that you wanted to talk about? Anything you guys coming up? Um, I'm super super excited i'm a huge green lantern fan so i'm super excited that hbo max that you're writing i don't want you to give away too many details on that but you know kind of what else is going on in the world of mark guggenheim see well let's well you know green lantern is it's a lot of fun um we are working hard away at you know writing scripts we've got um you know concept art and costume designs um and, and makeup effects and um like all, the, I mean, we already have like more concept art than you can shake a stick at. And it's it's all incredible and it all like blows me away and it helps fuel the writing. Uh, and we have, I'll just say like, just shout out to the writing staff. We have like one of the best staffs I've ever worked with. Um, just a, a murderer's row from top to bottom. And um, they're all, by the way, just they're also just really great human beings uh, on top of it. So uh, just, you know, even though we're doing the room by Zoom uh, these days because of COVID, uh, it's still a ton of fun. And they're, you know, that's, that's time I look forward to each day when we're working uh, together. Um, and we're just, you know, pushing forward. Uh, I wish I could say more beyond that, but Warner Brothers would kill me. Um, and Lord knows I've, I've run afoul of Warner Brothers a few times in my life. Uh, so, um, and apart from that, I'm also uh, with a writer who I've worked with on Arrow and Legends of Tomorrow, Obu Muhammad. Uh, I'm uh, re, speaking of 80s reboots, uh, I'm uh, rebooting uh, LA Law. Um, no, I look and, like the asshole. Um, <laughs> no, not all, not at all, man. No, and you'll edit, edit, edit out, edit out. <laughs> Sorry, should I, you want to get get it? And I, no, I, we're good, we're good. I didn't expect you to know. Um, so yeah, so I'm doing, uh, you know, the the reboot of LA Law, um, which you know, uh, Oba and I have just had a blast writing the script. Uh, I've, I've had a blast working with Oba and uh, Blair Underwood uh, is attached to reprise his role as Jonathan Rollins. So I guess I probably shouldn't call it a reboot. It's, you know, uh, I, I kind of call it a reimagining or a, I don't know, there, there's gotta be a name for what we're trying to do. Um, but uh, it's it's a lot of fun and, um, you know, it's in the, the hands of the, the network gods. Uh, we're, we're waiting on some uh, more feedback and stuff, but it's it's a lot of fun. Yeah, so definitely look forward to that. And I was just giving a hard time about <laughs> LA Law, of course. And I've been sitting there the whole time. I do want to give you major props. Love the spinner rack in the background there. Oh, thanks. You know, okay, so story about this rack. This is this is my most prized possession. Um, and apart from it being, it's not just a spinner rack. Um, it's the spinner rack that I bought my first comic book off of and much of my childhood collection. So it's uh, got a really special place in my heart. That, I love pieces like that that have almost sentimental stories behind them. It just adds to the collection. And it just adds to where I always say like, hey, my collection is fueled off nostalgia. And yeah, and to see other people with kind of that same sentiment is, is exciting. Um, also, real quick, before we let you go, people that are interested in following you, uh, social media, are you on Instagram? Yeah. Are you on Twitter? Where can people find more information about the good master yeah. of all things? pop culture it's very kind the check is in the mail um so on twitter i'm at m guggenheim and on uh instagram i'm just at mark guggenheim awesome make sure you guys follow that i'll also put links in the description of the video as well as graphics up here right now so people can see that and and follow but thank you so much for your time i really appreciate you man this This has been so much fun yeah this was um a fanboy moment for me i hope i didn't come off as too fanboys to the viewers but i i really enjoyed this and i'm telling you guys last flight out definitely want to pre-order that pick up copy pick up one copy cover a we always talk about cover a i guarantee you that you'll enjoy that first issue and then pick up the other ones and add it to your pull box but last word before we go what do you want to say to the viewers mark Hey, just thanks for watching uh, and thanks for being interested enough to, you know, listen to this. And, and you know, if you do check out uh, Last Flight Out, you know, I, I would certainly appreciate it. I, I, don't, I don't think you'll be disappointed.
Rack it up, rack it up, I got a bit of the bank to make me a safe house. Shake it up, shake it up, she got her hands on her knees and she bringing the cake out.